loosely. Mm -hmm. Loosely. Loosely, yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think? I mean, uh, just uh, poetry created. Yes, exactly. So ekphrastic poetry is something that um, a lot of writers, a lot of poets do, um, either to respond to art, to interact with art, um, or to just write about it. So I wanted to do this because it's a very important part of my practice as a poet and something that I find myself returning to uh, throughout the years, whether, or, you know, that means I need some inspiration or I'm kind of having a dry spell. You know, I find walking around a museum and really interacting with art sort of activates me. Um, so I wanted to share that with you all. So that being said, um, I'm going to open this session reading one of my own poems that is an epigraphic poem. Um, and then we'll talk about some poems, some features of epigraphic poetry. And then I'm going to set you guys loose in the museum to go and see what you find and see what you gather. And then we'll convene, hopefully we have enough time to share the things that we sort of uh, found. Does that sound good to you? Okay, awesome. So let me grab this. So this is a very famous sculpture. Um, it is called Perseus with the head of Musa, and it was sculpted by the Benvenuto Cellini. Um, this is a very, very important sculpture to me personally um, because I discovered that uh, the whole conceit about who Medusa was as a mythological figure actually um, we know now that she was based on black women. And so once I found that out, this sort of activated the sculpture for me and, and, and activated the myth um, of Medusa for me in this really wonderful thrilling. Right. So for those of you who might not know the story, um, Perseus slays Medusa, the good guy wins, right? But what's not often shared is the back story of how Medusa became Medusa, right? So she was a uh, temple maiden uh, at Poseidon's temple. No, it was a Athena's temple. Excuse me. She was a maiden in Athena's temple, and uh, Poseidon, uh, sea god, wanted to you know, he wanted to have sex with her, he wanted to be with her, right? And she's like, no, I'm a temple maiden, that's not it. So he rapes her, right? And Athena, to punish, uh, to punish Medusa, turns her into the creature of the story. So this is sort of where we lean into the space with, this is where we begin with this sculpture, right? We have Perseus who's slaying Medusa. So just so you guys have that context. So I will read the poem for y'all. It's called Hashtag Medusa was Black, y'all. Perseus, hold my dead lips up close to your ear. Let me tell you a secret with my split tongues. Once, long ago, Poseidon held a fistful of my black locks just like this. On the floor of the temple, fingers pulling at my scalp, he inhaled me. My body, soft, from lavender and holy oil. My robes, cast off and torn, spilled down over the altar, and even the candles dimmed in respect of my shame. My brown skin somehow paled in the fading light. The last thing I remember before the snakes came, before my body was lost both to the sea and to knowledge, a reflection of myself in the eyes of that cruel god, the imprint of his hands, hot and red as the sea on my neck, the chill of them first touching my face, the press and dead fish stink of that salty mouth, lips rough and cold as the jagged rocks of the deep against my collarbone. Picture, a girl built pretty and open like a temple only to be destroyed. Be kind. You are looking at ruins further ruined. What I mean to say is that the swift kiss of your sword on my neck is not unfamiliar, Perseus. I have tasted the sharp, quick pain of a man before. Thank you. <laughs> 
So um, I wanted to share that poem with you all to sort of get us into the zone of what it means to create plastic poetry, right? Um, I have some poems in here to like keep up with the time so that I don't totally eat into your creative time. Um, so I'm gonna probably talk for maybe about um, 10 or 15 minutes about this and we'll go over some poems briefly. And like I said, I wanna make sure you guys have enough time to just like, explore the museum and uh, sort of uh, create your own um, and craft some poetry. So what I will say about um, this process um, I put some tips here for y'all as you um, walk through the museum, as you think about this poetry, as you think about uh, what we do with this form. Um, some tips that have helped me uh, through the years. The first one's kind of weird, listening to the painting. That sounds weird, right? Listening to the painting, how do we do that? How can I listen to a painting? Um, for me, it's about perceiving the work and then um, also perceiving the voices that are emanating from that work. So what does that mean? We have the artist who's created the painting, and then we have the subjects of the painting. And then there's all of these different dynamics and things that are happening, entirely, right? And so we have to sort of sit back and ask ourselves, what voice do I need to hear, right? Is it the voice of the artist? Is it the voice of the subject? Who is speaking? Why is this voice important? And so as you move through the museum, as you think about these things, what I want to encourage you to do is listen to the painting, right? Follow whatever inclination that you might have, um, whatever creative direction that you might want to go in. Just listen to the painting, okay? Um, also observing the painting, okay? This seems obvious enough, um, but in order to write about a painting, you have to spend a little bit of time with it, okay? What does that mean? What does that look like? Observing details. Um, what stands out visually? Colors, composition, thinking about the way that this work of art is sort of coming together. Um, and just paying attention to what stands out to you, okay? Also, another very important element is trying to answer the question of why you're drawn to a certain thing in a painting. Why you're drawn to a certain color. Sometimes we don't always explore our artistic inclinations, why we're making the choices that we're making, but I think it's very important to be able to do that. So that's something that I encourage you to do. Um, and that brings me to the last point, which, as I said before, is paying attention to your own inclinations, okay? Are you seeing a piece of, of, of art or an image or a photograph that you have a strong reaction to? And then the question is, why am I reacting to it in this way? What is it about this work of art that, that makes me have this reaction to it, right? And sort of leaning into that space and thinking about that on a deeper level is very, very important. Uh, so yeah, that's just sort of an overview of what I'm gonna be asking y'all to do today and think about. Um, do y'all have any questions? I'm sorry, I'm going on long tangents talking about this. Um, but I want to leave space for y'all to ask questions or if you have any or anything like that before we march on. No questions? Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So how did you start um, how did you start using acrostic poetry in your own writing process? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I attended the creative writing workshop at the University of New Orleans and there I had a professor Carolyn Hemp um, who I think gave us a project to do this. Um, and I had never heard, I, I, I knew I knew about writing about works of art, but I didn't know there was a technical term for it, you know? And so this world sort of opened up to me in that moment. Um, and I started to sort of be more intentional about that practice and what it meant to go to a library, or not a library, a museum, <laughs> and just kind of walk around, explore, absorb and then just see what sort of uh, would rise up from that and so that's kind of how I guess I mean I've always visited museums my whole life but I was never intentionally visiting in order to create something I guess that wasn't something that I ever thought that I could do and so learning about this form learning about this practice really sort of opened up the art world for me in um, a really lovely and exciting way and that's that's how we're here <laughs> so 
thinking about that question, Liz. <laughs> so yeah, do y'all have any other questions? Um, what role does like the research you do into like the artist intentions play? That's an excellent question, and I almost included something about research here, but I didn't want to like totally go overboard uh, with the time we had. Um, but research is very, very, very important. Okay, so for instance, with the sculpture I just showed you guys, um, it started with me just looking at the sculpture, right, and then sort of exploring the mythology and like sort of taking it to like a deeper level, and that research sort of helped me to look at the sculpture in a different way than I previously looked at it, right? So my perspective on the um, on what was being presented visually shifted based on the research that I did. So I would say it's a really crucial part of it, or it can be, depending on what you're doing or trying to access or trying to learn about, um, it can really, hope, that can also be an end that opens up the work even more, it opens up your own work even more. Um, so yeah, research is very, very important. I try to always, look up the background about the artists and their life and um, you know what their focus was and things of that sort and then and then I can sort of um, come to the work with not only my own research but you know sort of a, a background on what drove this artist to make this particular thing and I think that's really important um, you know to consider when we talk about art when we talk about how we write about art um, and so that's something that I try to do. I'm trying to answer your question. Yes. <laughs> so yes, um, that's a great question as well. Um, any other questions? Okay. Do any of you have experience writing across the poetry? Okay, awesome. So yeah, did you, were you, did you know about the classic book that you were like, okay, or did you just kind of, I don't know, did you kind of get things Well, I, I don't know, I, I started, um, it's interesting, it's interesting that you, you say that when, like I said here, uh, when you like stuff, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did go through a period of, of years where I thought, um, I mean, I was writing, but I didn't think I was writing anything that I would ever want to publish. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I was happy to, and content to keep writing, but I still wanted to kind of like, um, I wanted something, you know, playful and fun like it used to be, right? And so uh, I ended up, uh, I have a friend who's an artist, and I ended up uh, just, because I'm a kind of hermitage type of person. So I would find myself in a corner, you know, next to something like writing or whatever. And so I, I did that, uh, she invited me to like a writing, uh, I mean, an art show mm -hmm. at a bar. I didn't walk with and I just kind of said, here people, and then kind of found the corner and just made a little band. And it wasn't the first time I had done it, but it was, it was just kind of remarkable in that moment because uh, I actually liked what I wrote and I shared it. So, uh, so it kind of put me on this path. Yeah, it sort of activated you. And somebody, like, I think around December or something, I, I was trying to put together an event, and uh, a professor I knew was there, like in Princeton, and I was like, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so then uh, I looked it up, I Googled it, and he, because he explained us, I didn't, I didn't really understand. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess, I guess I kind of get it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. You know, um, I love that this happens in a bar. You know, because there's so much happening in a bar, right, that you could be observing, but you're choosing to engage with art. You know, and and I love the fact that that really gave you that confidence that you needed to share your work. And that's something that else that I love about this forum is that generally you're like, hey, look what I found and like, look what I wrote about it. You know, you want to share it. You know, you want people to see it and perceive it and sort of see the, the background and the perspective that you brought to it. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Um, does anyone else want to share their um, experiences with, with the forum? If not, it's, it's fine, no question. <laughs> <laughs> I just love to hear about you know, people's different artistic processes. Um, but yeah, let's look at a poem or two. And I'll tell you a little bit why I chose these poems for y'all to look at and to think about um, in the next few minutes. And then we'll just go from there. Um, the first poem um, that I actually want you to look at first is the last one. <laughs> Um, the Kiss by Sasha Pimentel. 
I'm chosen this because it's a very famous painting. I think everyone knows this painting. Um, but what I love about this painting is, or this, the poetry based on the painting is that the perspective of the poem is very unique. Um, does anybody want to read that one for us to sort of get it into the air? The Kiss, Sasha Pimentel, on Gustave Klimt's painting, 1907 to 1908. Do you really think if you bend me, I will love you? You crack my chin up, your hands brown pigeon scheming reunion at my cheek and temple. Your jaw crag at the end of your thick neck of longing. I claw unto you as the only tree here. You will swim. I'm mad for gravity, though. I'm bound diagonally to you. Let me push from your trunk towards the edge and my freedom. Leave me to wither while moss weeps in the corners. Our halo liquid as you waving from our bodies heat. Our divinity melting. My dress blossoms loudly. You are still wrestling me closer. If only I could release to you my mouth just this once, and you would leave me. But the shadows of your robe are so haphazard. I know you will try to smother me again. The poppies scratch. My feet reach beyond spirit. Um, I really love this poem because I always viewed this painting in sort of like this like very romantic, just like, oh, wow, I wish I was wrapped up in this blanket, you know, <laughs> you know, like, like handsome man, you know. But when I read the poem, I was like, oh, my God, like, I don't want to be that blanket at all, you know. Um, it just speaks to a woman oppressed, right? And I just love it that this poet sort of looked at this painting and gathered a different sort of perspective on it and then gave us that perspective, right? She gives the woman in the painting she listens to the voice of the subject here. Okay. So that's what I think is um, Let's see another one here um, that I really loved. Um, let's see. Uh, the first one is called Impression of a Rib. Um, what I love, and I know this is in black and white, so you can't see it, but in the image, um, the woman is wearing a bright red dress, and the color red sort of informs this poem, right? It's sort of, uh, it's almost like an exploration of the color red. Um, and I think sometimes art, sometimes paintings, cause us to look at color in a different way, right? Um, and so I picked this poem for y'all so that when you are wandering around and you're looking at different works of art, if you notice a painting with a particular color scheme that stands out to you, use that, right? Try to sort of formulate that into something that you can work with and use. Um, and I can read this poem for you all too. Uh, it's called Impression of a Red. I have a red dress and no eyes. I have a dress that is blood red and I have eyes that don't blink when the balcony sucks in. My dress is a beat, swollen with thought. It hangs like a body on my body. I have eyes that don't blink at being seen. I was halfway finished before I saw I'd begun. My dress drips down the center. My eyes are needle holes, and my dress is an over red thread. I hang my words in the air by their feet, limp and damp, and my dress is my only laugh that is actually my eyes are the backs of moons and afterwards men just us like children and smoke and women who have been my dress circle, their stomachs with their hands. <coughs> I'm an actress. This is not my mother tongue. I have a dress that is yellow. My lines are written by a Parisian man. We met in London. I came dancing out like God upon a crimson wave. My dress hung like a question or a suddenness. He wrote me coming out. 
this way, he says, to make me like a lioness. The constellations are full of dead women, he says. He says, my dress is the coat of a great lion. I turn like the blood inside a rose. The crowd is a great gasp. I can feel myself become a pear. It's as if you haven't taken pills, he says. I still have that dress. It's not too blonde or red. You can grasp it with your eyes, he said, the way you wear it. Um, so yes, I think that poem for y'all to sort of demonstrate the power of a color. When you see the painting, it's like your eye just goes right to that one, right to that dress. Like everything else, and it's a, a scene like in a the theater, it's like there's all this movement, but for some reason, your gaze is just this woman. And so we get her voice and her perspective here. Um, and it's really lovely. Um, the last poem I picked for y'all, um, it's called Brownies of the Southwest Troops at Melbourne, and it's based on uh, this painting here. Um, and I'll read it for y'all. Three years before I hear the word beaner from the white boys who'd spit first in my broccoli, then in my hair, my mother dressed me each Wednesday in that brown sheath. I was seven. It'd be the only time I'd wear a sash. Miss America, she said. Twenty Miss Americas we made. Kitsch from clothespins, pipe cleaners, our brown socks, banded and complicated, with orange tassels just below the brown. Rosettes mm -hmm. of our knees, little skulls knocking together in our elementary school cafeteria. How we jumped the day. We heard voices raising there instead of at home. When Tracy's mom slapped our troop leader and Tracy cried, and Tracy's mom was white, and only her dad was brown, and Tracy was a little prettier than the rest of us. At the lunch tables, white bitch stuck to our fingers like blue fucking Mexicans landed like glitter onto the sashes laid across our small hearts. With Tracy, we watched manifest between us a line risen from the tiled floor where we shared meals as tears clung to the iron rims of my seven-year-old companions. Lorena chewed her nails till blood bloomed on her ring finger. Andrea peed quietly on her brown knee socks. None of us knew where to hide. This was not home where we could run to the room closet or to the feet of our big brothers. <laughs> um, I chose this poem for y'all um, because we get so little of what is happening in the poem from this from this image but there's clearly there's a girl scout uh, here you can't really she's in the it's not this is not a color but she's wearing the brown and then she's got the orange sash that she speaks of and it, it really pops out here and then of course you have the brownies right which sort of evokes like the cafeteria this cafeteria scene and it sort of takes you into this moment in the poet's life, right? She sees this painting and it probably triggers some sort of memory for her, right? And that's something else that drastic poetry allows us to do. It allows us to visually access things that we may have not thought about in years. Suddenly she's thinking about, oh my gosh, remember that time I crazy mom, like slap her troop leader in the cafeteria? You know, and all of this sort of becomes you know, by that. Um, so I wanted you guys to think about these poems, um, to think about the details, that are used in these poems, or what we're paying attention to, um, what's really calling to us from these different works of art. Um, and uh, just want to, you know, now take the time to set you guys free into the museum uh, to do the fun stuff <laughs> and go find um, paintings that speak to you and uh, see if you take some notes, um, see if a poem comes to you or some sort of writing comes to you.
Um, don't be afraid to do some research if you need to. Look up the artist or the background on the painting if need be. Um, and I'm gonna try to walk around. And I'm not gonna like hover over you guys, but you know, just checking in, you know, seeing how everyone's doing. Uh, and so now it's 12:32. So I'm thinking maybe you can tell me how you guys feel about this. Would you like to? have an hour of just wandering and writing in the museum and then maybe around 1.30 we sort of come back together and share what you know we've gathered and what we process and what we've written. How does that sound to you? Good? Okay. All right, awesome. Well, nice to All right, awesome. So yeah, so we'll meet back in this room at 1.30 um, and then we'll just you know, we can share or we can talk about our process or what we discovered. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> conversation about who was it and why didn't we know who it was yeah. and so then that made me like curious too to go research and find a little bit more about it yeah. so oh, that's awesome. well, do y'all want to share I mean I'll read mine first <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to share it. <laughs> it's not, oh, not that serious <laughs> um the picture's right outside here okay. uh, Michael Dees and Alan Hope so the, the title was They All Look Alike. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I saw your face, thought I knew you, seemed to think you remembered me. But as I got closer, I chuckled. They all look alike. Thought you were familiar, Mark Twain. Turns out you were never more the Edgar Allan Poe. They all look alike. I saw you in black and white, but color wouldn't have changed anything. They all look alike. <laughs> the secret of getting ahead is getting started. If all that we see is but a dream within a dream, they all look alike. It's a perfect likeness of you, even though I thought you were someone else. They all look alike. Wow. <laughs> that, was that was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's so much happening there with us. That title, I mean, it like takes us to a very, like, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know? And so I love that you bring us into that space and then sort of examining, like, whiteness, you know? And, like, there's certain figures there's like, okay, yeah, I know who that is, you know? But then it's like, do I know who that is, you know? Or is this just another, 
Yeah, I love that. That was. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> Did you want to share your your piece? So I don't feel like mine is finished because it then made me want to know more about Mark Twain. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay, but this is where I started with the same thought process. Okay. Um, so I said they all look alike. Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know. White men of importance. Their words are always right. But in my everyday life, it just creates strife. Mm -hmm. And then I just wanted to add to that more about each person's like work. But I don't know enough, or I don't remember enough. Because, um, like she said, you know, these are like people that we learn about in school and all of that. Um, but then, how you're taught that in school, but then later on in your life, how you understand it differently. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go like revisit these two people to think about how I would finish that. So that's what I was I love that y'all brought that up. Um, mm -hmm. Seven different reasons. So a lot of what we do with the classic poetry, it doesn't happen here, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is we're taking pictures, something is activating us, right? And then we take it and it sends us on some sort of deep dive, right? And so I love that that painting is going to be your doorway into exploring these figures and sort of exploring this like, I don't know, it's sort of like a mythology of whiteness. Like we're expected to know who Edgar Allan Poe is, we're expected to know who Mark Twain is, we're expected to know, you know, like there's like this canon that you're expected to know, right? Mm. Meanwhile, there are so many artists and writers of color who do not get that same, like, oh, you don't know who Edgar Allan Poe is? Like, yeah. you know, and so I think what both of your work is doing is sort of an in this like, please keep going with those. Yeah. So the the paintings I picked were the ones right outside the door. Uh, and they're kind of like American Gothic white peoples. <laughs> I picked it. Uh, I picked them honestly because I've personally been feeling a lot of like feelings uh, given the elections coming up and all this. So I just went with the. Uh, the paintings that I felt like I could tell, like a, a story that was true to me, but also like that uh, the elements were also in the painting itself, right? So uh, this is a little bit long, so I apologize, but this is called uh, "Thank God for Broken Promises." Ooh, good title. <clears throat> the white family stands romanticized as their spick cousin works in a fury to capture their triumph. A deer, dead on the roof of the truck, its limp tail dangles. They never did take me hunting. My cousin, in blue jeans and denim, stands stoically. His flat bill hat casts a shadow over his tired eyes. We have the same tired eyes. Did you get a good angle of my gun? He asks, embraced by his wife, who used to pinch my ears. Behind them, their blue pickup truck from Great Granddaddy, the one I was promised. They, uh, sorry, <laughs> they stood atop their land. The forest wiped clean. Only dead dandelion seeds remain. They never went camping again, at least not with me. Their son <laughs> looks at me intensely. He holds my old walking stick, the one I used to crack my cousin on the head. He's doing fine. <laughs> I note to myself, as his wife caresses his belly, I now remember, they never did give me my gun. We're both kind of like observing that painting at the same time, and it's just, it's very arresting. Um, it's so, it feels really modern. Like, it sort of feels like it was painted yesterday, but it was painted in the 90s. Like, I'm like, this could be like someone's Instagram photo, you know? Yeah. Like, the way that they, everyone's positioned, and like, you know, the, the way the gun is, but it's just, 
it's so, there's something, like you said, very Southern Gothic about it, right? Um, and just also like interrogating whiteness in this very, um, this very brave and um, just uh, prescient way, I think. Um, I, I love what you did. But 
what that one made me feel like, I thought about Mardi Gras, like just yes. being from here, it was, because in the title of it is cake, right? Yeah, I think it's cake. cake. Eating cake. Eating cake, so it made me think about king cake and Mardi Gras, and you know, just how that same piece can bring you in different directions based on like your experience and where you're you know, coming from. I love that so much. I, I'm Alan, I'm sorry. I'm Alan Balkan. I'm the deputy director here at the museum. But for most of my tenure at Aachen, I was director of education. And one of the things that we really love people doing here and that we understand is that we all come from different point of views, right? And what one artwork might speak to someone one way is going to speak to someone totally differently just because of their experiences. And I think that's like. So amazing. That's why I love art so much. And when we bring groups around, we use this process. And the first question is, what's going on? Not what do you see, but what's going on? Mm -hmm. And that really helps. Like people come to their own interpretations of their artwork, and then we'll ask, what do you see that makes you say that? Mm -hmm. You know, really kind of dig deep. Like, why is it mm -hmm. saying that? So, but um, I, unfortunately, I have to run. I'd love to hear more of your poetry. Um, we have another program at 2 o'clock in, in the library, which is another act, part, part of our complex that y'all are welcome to have the photography panel. Um, but also, um, you know, if you're interested, we'd love to put some of your poetry on our blog, on the museum blog, if you're interested. So you can always email it to me at um, education at aquamuseum.org. Maybe we can, um, I can start a Google Doc and maybe Liz, if you can share everyone's email with me, we can put it all in one place and we can just see everything. I don't know if you yeah, can feel about that. Okay. So I'd love to have more things like this here at the museum. Um, I think it's amazing people become inspired by artwork and create more artwork. So uh, I'm glad you all are here. And, uh, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, when the procession passed by my door, I removed my clothes, my eyes, my nose, my mouth. I followed. I can't say how many years passed as I waited. When my turn came, I climbed the stone pillar, held the boulder. Out of my stomach grew a new mouth. Out of my new mouth emerged a new body. I rode the sheep's back. I will not return. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's lovely. So haunting. <coughs> and those first two lines, I mean, oh, oh, it's just, it really is just, a, just, this stunning. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. It kind of leading to this sort of surreal. So you do get that sense of like desire and despair, you know, kind of happening. Like I want to be apart from this, but I have to sort of dissemble myself <laughs> to be a part of it, you know? I think we feel that way about so many things, you know, in life sometimes. Like, how do I experience this? How can I, you know, do I have to change myself to experience certain things? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. That was so wonderful. I can say I love that uh, you took that piece from familiar to, oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember the title and I remember Something about it, but as you as you went on, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember it visually. Oh, thank you. Great job evoking it, mm -hmm. you know, bringing it back into the room. Mm -hmm. Is that anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> So my, uh, the piece I chose was Clementine Hunter's Flowing River, which is one of my favorite artists, and I was familiar with her work, so I just wanted to do something that was somewhat of a tribute to her. Too. I called it Whispers of the River. Beneath the brush of Clementine's hand, flowing river unveils a sacred land where waters dance and stories flow in hues of warmth and gentle glow. With every stroke, a whispering tale of strength and struggle of hearts to travail. Through cotton fields and cypress trees, a timeless journey in vibrant seas. So let us linger by the river's edge where dreams take flight and doubts may hedge. For in Clementine's art we find a mirror of the soul forever in time. What about that painting in particular stood out to you? Um, the scenes of life, the people living, you know, um, the river itself winding. It just reminded me of the river here and all the things that we um, attribute to it as well, too. We can't have life without water. You know, so some of those things that we spoke to. The religious scenes too, you know, the, the baptisms, uh, the 
you see people going to church, you see people working, you see all of it. It's just like, you catch your life itself. And there's all the, and then in that scene, there's like, there's so many interesting, like there's like the form bearing content in this really lovely way. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Did anyone else want to share? I think I'm the only one else. But I'll share. Um, mine was inspired by um, the sculpture sculpture piece upstairs, um, Scared Dragon Rocky Horse. It's like at the end of the hallway. Okay, so that one. Um, I am a work of art, made up of all the leftover pieces of my life, the memories that will soon fade away. I am a work of art the lover of platinum hits that made us all shake our hips and dance to the beat. The songs that got me through troubled times. I am a work of art. The twinkling lights from the rings and bracelets I've worn over the years that shine with each move I make, the ones that made you look. I am a work of art, a collection of memories unique to me that will never be experienced by anyone else, even the memories you say aren't true. I am a work of art. Up close you may not see my beauty, but if you view me as a whole, you can't look away. Then you'll come close again and study all the parts of me you missed. I'm a work of art. Many parts of me have faded, but the dullness helps other parts of me shine. You can't mm -hmm. see the light if there's too much darkness. I'm a work of art, fashioned in such a way that my legacy will bring joy to those that can see beyond the tarnished parts. If only you could see me. I'm a work of art. I'm a work of art. I'm a work of art. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. Can I ask you why you chose that particular refrain? <laughs> if I chose that what? Why you chose that refrain, I am a work of art. I, you know, it was one of those things that when I saw the piece, I saw it and I said, oh, and I walked away. And then I walked right back and got closer. And I just started seeing all the little parts of it. And I'm like, oh, this is art. So in my head, I just kept saying, this is art. This is this is a work of art. This is all the little tiny pieces made up the whole. So that's kind of it was happening in my head. So I just wrote it that way. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I love that you sort of become one with the art. <laughs> right? You're, yeah. You're viewing it, but also being viewed at the same time, like an like an internal viewing. Yeah. Um, yeah. In this really lovely way that you present. Thank you for sharing that. It made me think of like the art objects watching us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's another perspective. You know, what what is what does the art think about us when we're walking by? You know, I so, agree with yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> something kind of like also exciting about that too. Yeah, and also like what, how we define art, like yeah. what is accepted as art and like worthy of being in a museum. It's yeah. The arbitrary. It makes me think maybe every human being is a museum. You know, that's what your poem sort of makes me think about. You know, um, the way we treat each other and participate with each other and, and watch each other, you know. Um, and how we try to understand each other. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, I don't know if we have enough time, but I could share um, some things that I, I... I didn't have anything really that long, but... I think there were two pieces that really stood out to me. I mean, I took so many notes. Uh, I did the um, the deer, the deer one um, that you did. Um, so I'll start with that one. It's not. I don't think it's fully together, but it's something. Um, nothing smacks quite of the American dream, like a dead deer slid on top of a trunk. Kill is what we came here for. You and I out front, I wield my shotgun like a scepter into the sky, proud about what I've done. And you, you hold me like you'll never hold me again, like I was planted here. You press the white of my shirt as cool, clean, and distant as God. And yes, this is the American dream. And yes, and yes, and yes. <laughs> and then the other piece that I wrote, and I was like trying to pull myself away from it to come back down here, was the Minnie Andrews as well, um, but the one that was called Mother Death. Um, I loved the title. I was like, Mother Death? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, it was just so like, what? Like, so I just wanted to like interact with that somehow. Um, so this is what I wrote. 
Mother Death, tell me this. What do you grow deep in the heart of your garden? Poppies planted like tears, bitter blackberries as, um, uh, as sweet as decayed punch. You used to be sweet, Mother Death, whispering your secrets only to the beloved who listened but never, but never once believed. I see you more than often than I like to admit now. Like all mothers, you tend to your children. Oh, you, uh, oh, sorry. Like all mothers, you tend to your children, never once seeing them for who they really are. And that is fine, Mother Death. Even you, like the rest of us, are entitled to your own delusions. It's clear, even you can make sweet things grow. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, um, I know we're almost out of time, um, but I just want to say thank you for coming and for being here and for doing this poetic experiment uh, with me today. It means the world. Your work is incredible, and I hope that you will continue to work on these poems and cultivate them and, um, and use, you know, Ichthyastic poetry as a doorway to, you know, other things, work and poetry and whatever your heart is calling you to write. So, thank you so much for being here. Y'all are all thank you. <laughs>